Um, my name is Heather Mystery. Um, I'm I'm an associate director here, um, and also looking at duck six with Tom Shave. Um, like Tom said, we're looking looking at the rules and seeing how we can help our clients um, become ready for reporting. So just to give you an overview of the agenda today, there are a number of areas that we want to, to go through. So firstly, we want to give you some background and overview uh, around the introduction of DAC6 and what the rationale um, into this introduction is. Then we want to outline the, the key timings around uh, the introduction and what you need to do and when. There are a number of key elements around the rules, uh, around um, who is actually required to report, and we'll try and bring this to life a little bit through a number of, of case studies. Given its new legislation, there are also a number of challenges in relation to uh, its introduction, and so we'll talk through those and what you need to consider um, to, to overcome them. And then finally, talk through how S&W can support you as an organisation in complying with the rules. Before we start, I just would like to have a quick poll um, from the audience to understand how much people know around um, DAC6 and see where uh, sort of knowledge lies. So we have four um, options here. Firstly, I have no or limited knowledge about DAC6. Secondly, I've heard of it, but don't know how it will impact my business. Thirdly, I've conducted an impact assessment. And fourthly, I've been tracking reportable arrangements since June 2018 and I'm ready to report. So if everyone can select an option, uh, then that would be good, and then we can feed back on the results. Give that a few minutes. Okay, hopefully everyone's selected an answer. Now, uh, we'll just wait for the results to come through. I'm expecting that uh, it will be some of the first um, of the two options rather than the latter two, given it's uh, relatively early days. So the majority of people have um, no or limited knowledge about DAC6. Um, a few people have um, come across it about 30%, um, but, have not, uh, but don't understand how it impacts the business. And we have um, no one who's actually tracking reports of arrangements since June 2018. So we'll get, hopefully um, by the end of this seminar, uh, people will have a better understanding of, of what's necessary to comply. So just to get into a bit more, a bit more detail around um, the MDR and, and DAC6. So already we're, we're throwing some acronyms around, um, just to, to explain what they, they are. So MDR is the Mandatory Disclosure Rules. Um, which is part of the OECD BEPS Action Plan 12. So the OECD um, introduced its Based Erosion and Profit Sharing Plan, which was a coordinated plan across a number of different jurisdictions to uh, look at how tax systems have been introduced and ensure that they are coordinated um, across the different countries uh, and to deal with the evolving nature of business um, as we move into a more technological age. As part of um, the um, MDR rules and the OECD's BEPS plan, the EU responded um, and introduced their Directive on Administrative Cooperation, DAC 6, um, which was effectively taking the MDR rules one step further. It draws a lot on the UK's um, Disclosure of Tax Avoidance Scheme, DOTAS, and effectively is a requirement for information reporting on a number of cross-border arrangements. So at a simple level, it requires intermediaries and in certain cases taxpayers to report uh, cross-border arrangements, and particularly in relation to certain tax planning um, circumstances to tax authorities. It, it's very similar in nature to some of the other information reporting regimes that we've seen introduced in, in recent years, such as the FATCA, common reporting, uh, the Common Reporting Standard, and country-by-country country reporting. 
it requires then tax authorities to share that information with each other so they can build up a picture of what uh, organisations are doing cross-border. So in one way, uh, we are quite lucky that the, um, the reporting requirements don't come in until 2020. But unfortunately, there is a bit of a fly in the ointment in that the directive actually came into force from the 25th of June 2018. And organisations that are caught by the rules will need to um, capture those transactions since June 2018 and report on them uh, if, if they're in scope. As usual with many of the uh, new uh, pieces of legislation that tax authorities are bringing in, uh, there are also likely to be um, penalties. The core legislation that, uh, that the EU has, has brought in, the EU has brought in uh, refers to effective, proportionate and dissuasive penalties. But those penalties will actually be set at a national level. So it'll be up in the UK, it will be up to HMRC to determine how the penalties will be applied in practice. And this is one of the key points to note. Although the, the EU has set out the, uh, the rules um, and the framework for, um, for cooperation, it's actually the responsibility of each uh, national tax authority to implement the rules. And we're still awaiting uh, legislation and, and guidance from HMRC, which we're expecting later this year, on the exact detail of how you report this information. There is clear that it will backdate to uh, June 2018. Just moving to the next slide, and, and just to give you a bit of a context of, of what, what DAC6 is, is trying to achieve. I think in, in broad terms, over the last few years, we've seen a number of uh, pieces of legislation introduced by tax authorities and driven by organisations such as the OECD around uh, looking at tools where they can crack down on perceived tax evasion, tax evasion and avoidance. And this is just the next tool in that, uh, in that series of uh, pieces of legislation. It will provide uh, European tax authorities early access to information about tax planning and they hope will actually act as a deterrent against uh, what they perceive as abusive tax uh, schemes. Over the last few years we've seen a huge increase in the tax transparency required of organisations and really tax authorities pushing the burden of tax um, information reporting onto uh, intermediaries, financial institutions, um, but also the taxpayers themselves to share that um, data with the, the tax authorities. And they're using much more data analytics tools to identify where there are um, gaps in their, in, in their revenue in, in their eyes. And DAC6 is another way of collecting further information on cross-border arrangements um, that can then be um, provided to the tax authorities. I'm now going to hand over to Hema to talk a bit uh, through the timings and also a bit more detail about the substance of the arrangements. Thanks, Tom, for setting the scene. Um, before I talk about this slide, I'd like to say if you have any questions, then uh, please let us know and we can answer them at the end. Um, so, we thought it would be useful to set, uh, set out a timeline showing the key dates to consider. As Tom mentioned, DAC 6, DAC 6 came into force on the 25th of June 2018. Um, arrangements from this date are within scope that have potential to report for, and therefore intermediaries and taxpayers should be looking and tracking um, arrangements um, from that date onwards. Um, although DAC 6 is already in force, the <coughs> tax authorities are only required to publish legislation from the 31st of December 2019. Um, as you may be aware, HMRC and very many other jurisdictions have not yet released legislation or guidance. Once this has been released, you should start reviewing the arrangements that you've already flagged as potential reports for, um, and may be able to review some, some of them out of scope, um, and you may want to consider whether there's any other arrangements that fall within the scope. First, this, sorry, go back there to go back to the slide. Um, 1st of July 2020 um, is the date 
that the law gives effect to Act 6 is in effect, um, and this includes a 30 day reporting period, um, which, as you will be aware, is not a long time to um, identify arrangements and report. Um, the next key date is the 31st of August 2020. Um, by this date, all reportable arrangements from 25th of June 2018 to the, 20, to the 31st of July 2020 will be reported to HFRC. So this will be a lot of information. The first exchange of information between member states is the 31st of October 2020. Um, the reporting obligation lies either with an intermediary or a taxpayer. The directive defines an intermediary as a person that is involved in designing, marketing, organising, or managing the implementation of portal cross border transactions. So it's quite a long <coughs> time. Um, it also includes those who provide assistance or advice, such as ourselves as tax advisors, um, lawyers, um, accountants, and um, many financial services institutions. The problem with, um, with this um, definition it also includes not just situations where you know an arrangement falls in the hallmark, but it also includes situations where the intermediary could be reasonably expected to know that the arrangement is reportable. Now, there's no definition of what is reasonably expected to know. Um, we're not sure how much digging around is required, um, and we've actually raised this point with HMRC, and we'll be discussing it further with them. To be within the provisions, the intermediary must also be tax resident in a member state. And now, there are many situations on the transaction that there could be multiple intermediaries involved, such as um, tax advisors, lawyers, accountants. Now the question arises who should be reporting or whether all intermediaries are required to report. Um, at the moment, the director doesn't give an order of preference of who should be reporting, um, but there is an exemption that applies. Um, where, um, where an arrangement has been reported, um, it does not need to be reportable, but the only, um, only issue with this, it does require proof and we don't know what sort of evidence is required. Um, it's also an exemption if an intermediary has legal professional privilege. Again, this isn't defined, so um, we're hoping that legislation will make this clearer. Um, whether it is legal professional privilege, and there's no other intermediary involved, the obligation to report falls on the taxpayer. Um, the taxpayer is also required to report where there are no other intermediaries involved or the intermediary is tax resident outside of the EU. <coughs> For an arrangement to be in Skype, it must include more than one jurisdiction, and one of the participants of the arrangement must be tax resident in the member state. Therefore, not all participants have to be resident in the EU for the arrangement to be reportable. We set out a couple of scenarios here um, that could be scoped. Um, under the first scenario, we have um, tax, two tax payers resident in two different EU jurisdictions. Um, this arrangement would be reportable, um, it includes a cross border arrangement. Now, if the intermediary is resident in, uh, in the EU, it would be reportable in that jurisdiction. If the intermediary is not resident in the EU, then the taxpayers themselves need to report. Um, now, we're not sure if both the UK and the German taxpayers need to report in their jurisdiction, or whether, again, uh, there'll be an exemption if one country has reported. The second scenario um, looks at where you have an EU taxpayer um, with an arrangement with somebody outside of the EU. Um, in this situation, again, it would be reportable, it has a cross-border element to it. Um, if the intermediary is resident in the UK or in the EU, <coughs> it would be reportable in that jurisdiction. Um, if it's outside of the EU, then actually the Spanish taxpayer would be obliged to report. Um, under the third scenario here, the arrangement is totally outside of the EU and therefore no reporting is required regardless of where the intermediary is resident. The scope of arrangements are, that are reportable are within the five hallmarks, um, and these are very widely drafted, um, so you can see quite a lot of different arrangements. I'll go through these briefly. 
Hall market A covers um, general hall marks that are linked to the main benefits test and includes arrangements that give rise to fees based on the tax advantage received by the taxpayer, where there's a confidentiality clause imposed on a participant or an arrangement has, has standardised documentation. For example, this could include standardised share option schemes that have a cross-border element. For example, if a share option scheme is provided to a non-UK resident employee. Hallmark B, again, is linked to the main benefit test, but it's in relation to specific tax planning arrangements. So these include buying off making companies to export losses to reduce um, tax liability, converting income to capital or other types of income that be taxable at lower rate, and around tipping of funds. Hallmark C um, actually covers um, specific arrangements linked to cross-border transactions um, and includes deductible cross-border payments between associated enterprises where the recipient is essentially subject to no or very little tax. It also includes arrangements where entities resident in a um, where entities are resident in a tax haven. So if you've got um, say Jersey in your structure, you, that may be called. Um, it also includes situations where a payment may benefit from a preferential tax regime. For example, um, it could include arrangements where you take advantage of the EU subsidiary parent directive or where there are domestic tax incentive schemes. Now, it seems quite unfair to bring to scope um, HMRC approved schemes um, and we're in the process of clarifying how um, DAPSIC interacts with these regimes. Hallmark C concerns arrangements that undermine the aims of automatic exchange of information provisions, um, which Tom mentioned earlier this back at um, the LS. Um, it includes arrangements that use the page structures to secure the identification of beneficial owners, um, and also includes arrangements that reclassify income into a payment that is no longer reportable under um, the automatic exchange of information provisions. Hallmark E is aimed at arrangements that exploit the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. So we'll now look at a couple of examples, a couple of case studies um, where the hallmarks might apply. So in this first case study, we have a UK intermediary who's providing a very standardised tax issue product to a German tax resident. Um, pay a taxpayer. Um, as um, it has fantastic documentation and it's got um, some tax benefits to it, it's probably going to fall within a hallmark A um, and the transaction is going to be reportable and it's between the UK and Germany. <coughs> um, the UK intermediary will report to HMRC, um, which would then exchange the information with German tax authorities. Now, if the UK intermediary has the professional privilege, the German tax resident would be obliged to report. Um, these are the German tax authorities will have um, this information. It would increase, increase the risk of inquiry if the disease um, and avoidance is taking place. So we move on to case study two. Under case study two, we have a UK company. Um, that is transferring um, some software that's, um, that's in its early stages of development to, to its subsidiary that's resident in France. And this may be for totally purely for commercial reasons. It might be that the developers that are based in France um, and want to be employed um, by a French entity. Um, so um, that's totally commercial, but the issue here would be how, how easy is it to value this intangible likely that revenue streams, revenue streams are um, not easily readily um, estimated and so it would fall within the hallmark E. Um, so um, in this situation we have the UK intermediary that's providing the advice on this transaction um, and will be reporting the transaction to HMRC. Now, if we were to just flip this around and have the transfer of the software from France to UK, um, 
again for total commercial reasons, but the lending in UK company looks to claim R&D benefits um, on the software. Um, this might fall within hallmark C then, as well as E, um, are they looking to reduce their tax liability. Um, again, similar to the previous example, um, this wealth of information that the UK and the French tax authorities have um, just increased the potential of inquiries. So what information must be reported? Now, when processes are being put in place, they identify reportable transactions, intermediaries and taxpayers should consider what information is reportable, where this information is held in their system, and how this information can be extracted. It may be that the current databases that we have in place for other regimes, such as FATCA and DRS, can be used to extract some of this data um, and help with efficiency. Um, the table on this slide sets out the various aspects of this reported. Now, for a taxpayer, you may think um, I'm not, um, I've got intermediaries reporting for on my behalf, but you should still be concerned as your details will be reported um, and, as we mentioned, the um, tax authorities will have your information and if they believe that any avoidance going on, they inquire. Now, we suggest taxpayers keep. Um, or records of any commercial information that can help that position. Um, should also include details of the hallmark, um, details of the cross border arrangement. This could include business activity, it does not need to include any trade secrets, um, the value of the arrangement, um, and details of the member states that are relevant. Yeah, as Tom mentioned, we'll be looking at the number of challenges um, that involve his access. Um, well, firstly, there are not many, there are not many definitions, um, and HMRC haven't received haven't received any guidance for legislation. <coughs> this makes it difficult to identify reportable arrangements, um, but we do not recommend that waiting for legislation to identify arrangements. Um, as retrospective um, identification can be challenging. Um, also, as mentioned, the hallmarks are very widely drafted, it can bring very many commercial arrangements into the scope. Um, as, yeah, for example, we gave the example of a share scheme, and that's quite a normal, common situation, bringing quite a lot of arrangements into the scope. Um, now, for many financial institutions in the financial sector, there's likely to be a large volume of transactions that could be portable um, due to the standardised products that provide to clients, um, which is likely that, uh, well, with the directive um, drafted as it is, that each, report, each transaction would need to be reported for each separate client. Now, this does mean there will be a vast amount of reporting, um, and we suggest that financial institutions look to put processes in place to identify these transactions at an early stage to, to minimise the administrative burden. And Tom will, like, Tom will talk later about um, these sorts of um, processes that you might want to look to put in place. Now, there are um, many situations where an individual acting on behalf of an intermediary does not know if the transaction they're working on meets another hallmark, um, as he or she may not be a tax professional. Um, but it may be that together with other employees of the organisation, um, the, the intermediary itself would be able to identify the transaction as reportable. The imperative that intermediaries put processes, processes in place that involve various departments within the firm to aid the investigation of portable arrangements. Um, we don't we don't know how much um, HMRC are going, going to expect intermediaries um, to be responsible for reporting when you've got this situation where one person may have may not know whether the transaction is portable. Um, and because it has been highlighted to other departments, so <coughs> they would be out of scope. 
Now, the timing of reporting is also quite challenging, as the directive states that an arrangement becomes reportable the earlier of the day after the arrangement is made available for implementation, the day after the arrangement is ready for implementation, or the first step of implementation has been made. Now, there's no definition of made available, ready for implementation, or what is considered as the first step. As an intermediary, it's quite likely you don't know when any when one of these steps have taken place. Um, it's quite common for clients to delay transactions or change a transaction at the last minute. Um, and so it's going to be challenging to determine when the date that the arrangement becomes reportable. Um, we've highlighted this issue with the HMRC and again we'll be discussing this further with them. And there's also a very tight time frame to report um, of 30 days. Um, as we all know, internal processes can take a while. It's likely to involve two departments and many layers of sign off. Um, therefore, it's quite important that processes that are put in place do help with um, making sure it's that you can report arrangements within 30 days. Um, otherwise, um, it, well, the directive does will really impose penalties for late filing. So as that fits apply to cross-border arrangements, intermediaries should consider how the regime in different countries will impact the reporting requirements. Similar to HMRC in the UK, many jurisdictions have not yet released legislation or guidance on their implementation of DAC6. We anticipate that we anticipate differences in regimes implemented across the EU, which will result in difficulties in identifying reportable arrangements. Intermediaries will need to be aware of the different regimes, as it may be the case that an arrangement is not reportable in the UK, but would be reportable in another jurisdiction. Um, this should be a key consideration when putting processes in place to identify reportable transactions and for the reporting process. Now, we're currently aware that Germany and Poland have released that legislation and there are differences between the two, um, and the Netherlands have released, got released some provisions in December. So we are aware that uh, many organisations have raised concerns about GDPR, and that the EU have confirmed that the collection and reporting of data on the DAC6 is compliant with GDPR regulations. Um, this one other thing that we should be concerned about is the wealth of information that each member state will have um, held on databases and have access to. Um, this will give the tax authorities a vast range of information um, for them to target their inquiries, um, raise their revenue, and then we, are, we do anticipate that there will be an increase in the of tax audit. Um, now you may be, may be thinking, uh, we Brexit round the corner, nobody knows what's happening, um, will this, will that fix still be implemented um, if we have a hard Brexit? <coughs> Unfortunately, HMRC have confirmed that there will be implementing that fix regardless of the outcome of Brexit. Now I'll pass you back on to Tom, who will talk about how you can prepare. Thanks, Emma. Um, it seems that uh, there can be no um, silver lining with Brexit. Everyone's looking for any uh, silver lining, uh, and unfortunately, DAX, the non-introduction of DAX 6 is not going to be one of those. Um, I just want to uh, just recap some of the key points um, that, that Hema talked through before we sort of go into sort of key areas of how we can we can support. So, number one is. Uh, the, the biggest impact of DAC 6 is going to be on intermediaries. So if you are um, an intermediary, it's, it's pretty critical that you consider the impact, um, particularly given the timing of the introduction of DAC 6. So although reporting won't be until um, 2020, there will be requirements um, to, to look back to 2018. And the reality is that given the broad scope of DAC 6 and the different hallmarks that Hema talked through, there's a pretty wide range of um, cross-border transactions that could be caught. 
And so we would definitely recommend that you start putting in place processes to capture those transactions in, the, in a sort of broad enough nature um, so that as an intermediary you can um, report on those as necessary. Just to give you, to bring that to life a little bit, um, within SW we've um, set up a, a process to capture that information and are uh, collating that uh, data so that when the reporting does come round, we're in a position that um, we can go through that relatively quickly without having to, to go back and try and recreate uh, the different transactions that, that were in scope. Secondly, uh, although the focus, uh, the biggest impact is on intermediaries, there is still quite a large impact on, on taxpayers. If the information is not going to be reported by an intermediary, then there is an obligation that falls on a taxpayer themselves. And this is going to create quite complex um, situations whereby you're going to have to be, have communication to understand with the intermediary whether there was reporting by the intermediary and if not, then what um, reporting are you going to undertake? Heather talked through some um, examples, some case studies which try to bring to life different scenarios that that might occur in. And again, I think this is one of the complexities of DAC 6 is to ensure that you've got your planning in place to make sure that you can report if you're required to. Finally, the, uh, the sort of key element is around um, understanding how the legislation and guidance is going to develop. There have been a lot of um, queries um, being asked of HMRC um, because of the, the scale of, of potential reporting that's required under this regime. And we've been in um, various communications with HMRC. So if uh, businesses or individuals want us to, to raise points with HMRC, please do let us know and we can um, raise those with HMRC. And we, we believe that a lot of the or aware that a lot of the industry associations are, are doing uh, similar points so that um, the scope can be very clear when the guidance does come out. Um, so just to sort of talk a little bit around um, key things that um, organisations should be doing to prepare and again how SNW can, can support. So the first element is really around an impact assessment. This is a sort of common way of, of dealing with new pieces of legislation. The approach there is to consider um, what is the, the key elements that what are the key elements that will impact you as an intermediary or a taxpayer. So that's taking what we do know today and, and notwithstanding the fact that HMRC haven't released their um, guidance, there is quite a lot of information out there from the European Commission around the, um, the nature of the reporting. So we've worked with organisations to take that information and scope out what transactions would be in, uh, in scope for reporting. And you can effectively assess um, what transactions have been in, would be in scope since June last year and then capture the relevant details around those transactions. So it's not only looking at the, the functions of your, your business that are likely to be caught, but also potential products. Now, given this is in relation to cross-border transactions, you know, those businesses that are involved in, in international business are much more likely to, to be impacted. And again, that's one of the uh, aims of the impact assessment is to assess the, the size of the impact. And that can enable you to plan your approach for compliance. When we've uh, looked at this for, for organisations, in some cases there are literally uh, tens and hundreds of transactions that are potentially in scope and actually collating the data for that is quite a big undertaking even going back to June last year. Given you're going to have to continue to do that until the reporting date of 2020, then we do recommend that uh, if you think you're going to be significantly impacted, you start that process now. The second element is to identify processes. 
what do we mean by that? Effectively um, putting in place frameworks to actually collect data on an ongoing basis. So there's almost two elements to this. You've got to look back at historic transactions from June last year, but on a on a going forward basis, want to have a um, a method in place that enables you to readily collect collect the information on um, transactions. What we've used uh, with with clients and internally is effectively a um, glorified spreadsheet to collect the nature of the. Um, the transaction and the relevant information that would likely need to be reported. And again, we'd be happy to, to talk clients through that. We would say, um, where possible, do leverage um, existing information reporting processes. So um, if, if you're required to report under um, FATCA or the Common Reporting Standard or um, country by country reporting, you will have hopefully introduced a, um, a process to collect information for those processes and have started to respond to these uh, increased requests for data from the tax authorities. So you can leverage the approach that you use um, in those circumstances to also apply to DAC6. One of the sort of key questions we get asked uh, is who should be taking responsibility for this? Now obviously um, in the first instance because it's a sort of piece of tax legislation, um, it's often um, hitting the, the, the tax function or the finance function first. But as with a lot of these information reporting requirements, the um, responsibilities lie across the across the business, and there will be um, transactions, as Hema alluded to, that uh, people may not be aware have particular tax advantages or not driven by. Um, tax planning opportunities that again could be brought into um, the scope of the of DAC six, and therefore there will need to be um, appropriate education of um, people across the business, and agreeing um, those stakeholders who will need to collect the information and feed that back. We would still um, recommend that there is one um, individual who is given overall responsibility within the organisation. And that will, and who that the identity of that individual will depend on the circumstances of each business. And some businesses operate on a, a quite um, fragmented basis, and where there are others are much more centralised. Again, you'll have to look at the nature of your business to determine who that should be. But that is again something that S and W can advise on. The other point is around um, actually reporting and implementing those reporting frameworks. So hopefully over time you'll put in place um, data collection frameworks and try and collect that data in a structured way. And you'll then need to use a, a tool to um, actually uh, prepare the reports and, and use the reporting schema and similar to what we see in other information reporting uh, piece of legislation. We would recommend that um, you have an appropriate audit trail so that you can link back um, information that has been reported to tax authorities to the underlying information and ensure that um, if challenged then you can illustrate where the, where the information has come from. As, a, um, as an intermediary, it may be also that you're required to um, actually report to underlying taxpayers and inform them that they have been reported on. And again, that would be a key consideration. Final area is um, around legislation developments. So although effectively this uh, DAC 6 is, is live, given it's um, in scope already, uh, transactions are in scope already, um, we are expecting UK legislation and guidance to be released during this year. Uh, again, we would recommend that you monitor those developments because we expect that will give more information on how the uh, transactions are to be reported. And you know, we will con continue to try and update the clients ourselves, but also keep alert to industry associations 
and consider the interaction with other EU countries. Unfortunately, we don't think that um, Brexit will help uh, with um, removing the obligations. Um, and the main reason for that is that uh, HMRC are keen to continue in information sharing regimes um, with other tax authorities um, and particularly with their European counterparts. <coughs> so just before we move on to questions, there's sort of, um, a number of key points that we would recommend and that you are aware of. Firstly, um, the scope of this piece of legislation is um, potentially quite broad in, in the, arrange the cross-board arrangements that could be caught. So do take, although there isn't legislation out there in the UK, do take, uh, be aware of it because it's a slightly odd situation that it's retrospective when the legislation comes in, so that uh, these uh, transactions that are in scope from June last year will be in scope. Therefore, we would recommend that, particularly if you're an intermediary, then you undertake an impact assessment and actually consider how you're going to deal with it. If there, if you do uh, undertake a lot of cross-border uh, transactions or have a lot of cross-border arrangements, then do start um, implementing processes and, and ways of capturing data. Again, there are a number of tools uh, out there that can facilitate that and we'd be more than happy to talk that through with, um, with organisations. Thirdly, monitor developments. So there is a lot to take in and we've only really scratched the surface today. And I appreciate that some of the points that we've covered are quite complex, particularly around the hallmarks and get into quite a lot of detail. So do sort of read up about it and monitor what the UK is, is doing and more widely the um, EU. And finally, we are here to support clients and support them with uh, their key uh, considerations about how they should comply. So that's the formal part of the, um, the presentation over now. And um, we've had a number of um, questions um, come in, um, quite a few questions on Brexit. Hopefully we've um, covered off that um, point. Uh, and just to clarify that anyone was uncertain, HMRC have explicitly said that they will still implement the provisions of DAC 6 irrespective of Brexit and that includes a no deal Brexit. Um, so one of the, the next questions we've had is um, around really challenging whether an organisation needs to do anything um, if they, given that HMRC have not released any guidance or legislation. And I think that's a a fair question. Um, it's hard given that you know, there's obviously a lot will be a lot going on in your businesses and just from a tax compliance uh, perspective there is a lot, of, lot to deal with on your plate. So I guess our, our reflection on that is it's definitely worth um, considering the potential impact of, as you, on you as an organisation. So if you're um, particularly in the financial services business or, or advisory business, then it's likely to have quite a significant impact on you and we would definitely recommend that you, you undertake an, an impact assessment. Um, we would also sort of advise that if you are involved in a lot of cross-border um, arrangements and transactions, then again you consider the, um, the implications of DAC6. I don't think you need to go out and you know, necessarily have a um, reporting tool to be able to uh, actually deliver the reports yet because that, the reports won't be required until 2020. But if you are one of those higher risk groups, you should have a framework in place um, to collate information um, so that you're not caught unawares in 2020 or even later this year when the legislation does come out and you have to go back to 2019 because that will be quite a, a tough ask 
to collect all the information that is required um, under DAC6. Um, Hammer, I think we had a, yeah, so a, a second question. You've just got another question three. Um, asking what the definition of an intermediary is um, and whether <coughs> a company themselves that do not consider themselves to be an intermediary but do many transactions themselves uh, would be caught. In this situation, yes. Um, again, as a taxpayer, you would you would be required to report if there's no intermediary reporting on your behalf. Um, so, yes, I guess you would be in scope and you would need to start looking at processes and identifying transactions that may fall within the regime. Um, if there is an intermediary in place, then again, I would check to see whether they are reporting or not, or whether they have the obligation to report. Um, so, HMRC, some of the um, some of the conversations we have had with HMRC have highlighted where you have in-house tax teams and they would be considered um, as, as intermediaries to report. So, um, again, if that's your position, you should be looking to report those arrangements. Um, we've had another um, question around um, the focus of DAC6 and whether it relates to um, uh, tax planning schemes. Obviously, that is um, one of the drivers of the, the legislation. However, the way that um, the DAC 6 has been drafted by the European Commission means that uh, all sort of cross-border um, arrangements that potentially have a um, tax benefit could be in scope. So it's not just about um, arrangements where there are <coughs> there's a pure underlying tax-driven reason, even if there's a commercial rationale for why an arrangement or transaction has been undertaken, then that could be um, caught in scope if there is um, tax implications of that um, commercial arrangement. So again, that's one of the reasons why we're recommending that people look at the different scenarios to understand um, whether their, the arrangements they're um, undertaking could be caught. There's another question around um, uh, dealing with offshore clients. Um, again, that's the type of scenario that will be caught um, under DAC 6. So uh, you know, try, what we're trying to do is, is try to uh, really, uh, I guess, consider how um, DAC 6 will be applied. And, and the way it's drafted is potentially pretty broad, which is why we're recommending people take account of it now uh, and sort of start planning for whether those transactions are, are in scope. Um, I think we had another question um, around if the if they do not if you do not consider our business they do not consider their business to be an intermediary, can I know that six? So it depends to be honest. So if if you have no intermediaries involved, or the intermediary has um, legal privilege, um, or, or the intermediary is a tax person outside the EU, then as a taxpayer, you may be required to report. And so you will need to, in the first instance, understand whether the arrangement you've entered into is reportable and is being reported by, by an intermediary. And if it's not, and it is reportable, then um, you could be in scope. Again, that's um, quite complex, and we, we appreciate that it's quite a complicated um, picture, um, and that's why uh, we uh, you need to start mapping out some of the hallmarks that Hema talked through earlier around your specific business to see how they apply. Um, so we've had a question um, here on. Um um, intermediaries um, asking if a client um, requests that the information is not reported to HMRC, whether this, um, whether they can exclude this arrangement from reporting. Um, the short answer to this is no. Um, if it's within the hallmark, it does require reporting um, unless you have legal professional privilege, and then the taxpayer themselves would be obliged. Um, so. Um, it's quite important that you do you do report regardless um, of requests from taxpayers. Um, so we do 
Um, but we do suggest that you do, do you do let your taxpayers know that you are going to be supporting arrangements on them. Um, we've also been asked um, what the definition of an associated enterprise is. Um, an, associate, an associated enterprise includes a person that participates in the management of another person by being in a position to exercise significant control of another person. Now, this is quite unclear um, when this would apply um, and when in the process of um, clarifying what circumstances this would apply for individuals um, and for corporate entities with HMRC. Um, I've had a question if there's one thing we should do now, what, it, what would it be? I think that depends on what the nature of your business is. So if you um, are an intermediary or you do a lot of cross-border um, transactions, then I think it's worth looking back at uh, tr arrangements or transactions since last June to see which ones would have been in scope under the hallmarks. Um, and that will give you a sense of how big the impact will be for you going forward. Um, for, for other organisations, I think it's um, a much more general point around um, understanding whether there's anything that might be in scope uh, under, under DAC 6 and planning how you would deal with that. I mean, as I've already mentioned, the, the rules uh, around what's going to be reported is likely to be um, you know, really spelled out by HMRC over the next few months. And we have had a lot of questions that we've um, submitted to HMRC asking for clarity, both for us as an organization, um, because we are also caught at this, but also for our clients. Again, if you do have specific questions that you would like um, to uh, to, to, for us to raise the nation, so please do let us know. Um, so we've just had a question um, asking whether the rules are just aimed at um, tax planning that is considered aggressive. Um, so no, the hallmarks, as mentioned, the hallmarks are quite wide and do, do cover commercial situations. It um, does require some sort of tax advantage, but like we said, it could be an approved scheme. Um, that so it wouldn't be considered aggressive, but it, it is within scope. So it doesn't need to have some form of tax advantage to be in scope. Okay, I think we've covered off most of the um, questions that we've received. So thanks very much, everyone, um, to for sending through those questions. And um, we will be circulating the slides. Um, at, and if you do have um, questions, then do you come more generally, or you want points to raise with. Um, HMRC then do come back to Hemmer or, or I or your usual S&W um, contact. Thank you very much for everyone joining um, and we hope you join future S&W sessions. Thanks and goodbye.